so welcome to everybody listening now and in the future. To, today is our free lecture with Jim File. Um, he'll be lecturing uh, as a, a little bit about the upcoming series that he's going to be giving in the online school. Uh, but it's about mirroring and attunement. So let me get the correct title here for, for our talk today. Attunement, Resonance, Mirroring, and Rhythm with Jim File. So I like to just to take a moment and introduce Jim. Jim File has over 45 years in the study, practice, and teaching of energetic and somatic therapeutic practices. His first career was a te as a teacher of English and American literature. He began his career in therapy by studying with the founder of polarity therapy, Dr. Randolph Stone, in 1970, and went on to earn his doctorate of chiropractic degree in California in 1986. He began studying formative psychology with Stanley Kellerman in 1981, continuing until his passing in 2018. He has studied and taught craniosacral biodynamics with Franklin Sills, and pre- and perinatal therapy, among other methodologies. He works with adults using verbal and body-oriented techniques, specializing in formative and somatic methodologies. He has taught in the U.S. and throughout Europe and in China. His work directs itself at helping individuals form themselves to effectively and competently respond to life, transitions, challenges, crises, and opportunities. So please go ahead, Jim. Well, thank you, Kate. All right. Good. So that's me, I think. I think I recognize the person that all those words refer to. So anyway, so here we have uh, we have an hour. Welcome, everybody. We have an hour. And let's see if we can use it in such a way that hopefully is interesting and beneficial. Um, and um, so the, the topic, four very big words, even though they're, you know, they're words that we've all heard many, many times, and we probably have a sense of them. And many of us probably feel we, yeah, we, we use them regularly: attunement, resonance, mirroring, and rhythm. Yeah, but it turns out each one really is a is a whole world of possibility. Yeah, that uh, really it takes a lifetime to continue to refine each one of them. We can always attune with more nuance, with more subtlety, with more depth, you know, we can resonate with more clarity. We can, we can mirror, which is a, you know, also a, a very, uh, a very kind of complex and layered process. And rhythm is at the heart of it. Rhythm is at the heart of life, right? Uh, we we're alive because we pulse, right? And then that pulse has a fundamental rhythm and then it has many additional rhythms to manage, you know, us, us in the many life situations we find ourselves. So rhythm is probably the key, the key element that we really need to learn, um, you know, with with a lot of attention and a lot of nuance. So uh, nonetheless, attunement, resonance, mirroring, and rhythm. They are kind of first steps in what we're calling a, an unfolding and emerging process. When we work with people, um, the, the word that probably kind of over, overlays the work I do these days is formative. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, related to the human form in all of its different stages from conception on through old age and into transitions to the next stage, yeah. And and that's a formative process. And it's a word we kind of hear a lot too. Maybe we have an idea about it, but there are a lot of words these days that um, kind of are, you know, are at the threshold of people's awareness in terms of doing therapy. Formative, which I've taken from Stanley Kellerman's work, uh, his formative psychology, I think is is really wonderful. What I love about it is that it first and foremost it tracks our evolution from conception to to the end. It's actually, but in a very anatomical and um, and physiological biological way. At the you know, so it's very somatic at its root. And then um, anyway, maybe you'll see a little bit of why and how formative is really 
a central focus for the kind of work and the that I do and the way I use these four terms in the work. So, um, so just to, you know, it's a it's a big topic. So I'm going to kind of cherry pick a bit, and then um, I think maybe we'll have time uh, in the, the second part of uh, the talk to do actually maybe a, a short interactive segment with somebody. Yeah, fifteen or twenty minutes and see if if we can demonstrate even on a small screen um, how how we begin to use and apply these topics. You know, if you think about something like attunement, you know, we are, you know, humans are built to attune. You know, we have we have the nervous system, the neurological capability and and the motivation to attune and to resonate and to mirror uh, and to and to rhythm. And so those are all functions uh, that are inherent to us. But like anything, they're functions we need to develop, you know. So we may have a great sense of rhythm, but if you don't learn an instrument, you don't play music, right? So they need to be developed as 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 art forms, really. And um, so you know, you can have, for example, you know, psychopaths have great capacity to attune, but what do they use that attunement for, right? And it's the same with any of us. We have a great capacity to attune, but what are the is that attunement in service of, right? And what is the resonance in service of? So what do we serve when we are working and when we're using our skills? So um, so first, I'd just like to say that, you know, when we work with attunement and, you know, the resonance, the four, the four categories, the four, four concepts, it's first of all about really immersing ourselves you know, in the in a dynamic flow, a dynamic flow of interaction, right? A client comes in or a student comes in, and there is already a, a dynamic flow of sorts. Yeah. And we can be in relation to that flow in different ways. We can be a bit distant from it, you know, observers of it, you know, cool, or we can immerse ourselves ever more deeply into it and really participate. Uh, from, you know, inside that field of experience. And um, of course, they need skill. The deeper you go in immersion, you'd better be able to find your way back out, right? You need to kind of have a sense of how you manage yourself as you share, you know, a partner in this dialogue and share this intersubjective space with the other person. So it's very dynamic. And there are a lot of signals that are going back and forth, right? A lot of stimulation going back and forth, a lot of cues going back and forth. And so there's a lot to, to catch, a lot to kind of resonate with, a lot to, to process when we, when we are interaction, interacting with people. So a lot of people kind of go to a more protocolized way of working as a way to keep this process simple, right? Humans are incredibly complex and we need to, you know, not dumb it down, but keep it, make it simple so that we can manage both ourselves and the process that the other is in, even as we respect this amazing complexity that we are. Yeah. So, um, so how do we, you know, how do we, yeah, take in the information that comes to us, right? Which is what happens now when you attune, you know, you are, you know, the attunement's a little bit different from resonating. Resonating, there's a signal, there's a stimuli, something, uh, an oscillation. And emerging from the other person. And when I resonate with the other person, it's not just that I'm in the same frequency, by my resonating, I'm amplifying the signal. So resonance has to do with amplifying. Attuning is about finding the frequency. Resonating is about amplifying the frequency. Mirroring is about sending it back somehow to the other person with the information that you have picked up from them. Yeah. And, and you can try to make 
a very precise mirroring, you can add things to the mirror. You know, when we look at, a mir at ourselves in a mirror, first we want to see ourselves, but then we want to see those parts of ourselves that we can't see without the mirror, right? Do I have ketchup on my face? Do I have, are my colors not quite as, you know, kind of coordinated as I'd like, right? Is it time for a haircut, right? Whatever. And so the mirroring process, first it shows you you, and then it starts adding information that you can't see without the mirror. And so these are kind of already, you can begin to appreciate that each, that attunement and resonance and mirroring are all kind of very related, but they actually have slightly different functions, which it's very nice if we differentiate them. Yeah. So, so okay, so a person comes into our space, our, our therapy room or our classroom, whatever we, we happen to do, or our studio, whatever it is that we're doing, yeah? And they bring their story with them, right? What's the person's story, yeah? What are they trying to communicate? What are they trying to express, yeah? And so in our perspective, when we look at it from a formative point of view, there's an expression going on, but even more so there's what we're saying, there's a forming going on. Normally bring people bring in difficulties, challenges, crises. And these are all challenges in forming, forming a response to a situation, right? And the forming may be taking something down. Maybe they're still responding to their situations as they did when they were four years old, five years old, right? We know all about the, the child layers, the child parts, the wounded parts that are still, you know, working and, um, and influencing our adult interactions. So it's these are kind of coming to the fore, right? They're looking for a way to express, but even more than a way to express, they're looking to, to form and reform, right? We're looking to assemble new ways of behaving and disassemble kind of ways that no longer work. And this is kind of fundamentally, so we're forming, expressing as a step, but then having an influence on all of this is a critical part of it, yeah. And so when somebody brings in their story, we, you know, we're looking at how exactly do we listen? You know, now many of us have taken many seminars, we've worked with mentors, we've, we've developed a certain way of listening and listening, of course, you know, is a selective process. We select out of the story, those things that we think are important. Yeah. Uh, whatever st system we've used will tell us that's important. Don't worry about that. Focus on this. Look at this sensation. Look at that content. Look at that emotion. Look at that gesture, right? So so we will be listening with our filters um, in order to be able to orient to what's happening and and to what we can do. And so what you know, what do we listen for? What how do we interact with it, right? What do we notice? when we're paying attention, right? Exactly how do we intervene, right? So a whole series of questions, which I think most of us, you know, are, are, are familiar with, you know? And, and then questions like, how do we make real contact? How do we evoke deeper layers of what's trying to emerge and form, yeah? How do we evoke what's being defended against so that it can be dealt with in a more mature way? So how are we doing? Is my rhythm and everything working okay for people? You're able to follow me. Okay, it's hard to, hard to know sometimes on the small screen. So, so you know, one of the, there are so many interesting doorways onto this process of, of uh, not just therapy and education and art, but, you know, the, the, the attuning, resonating, mirroring, rhythmic process. Wow, I mean, I just, I keep repeating it because it evokes something very, you know, big and wonderful. 
right? It's really very, it's very much about life itself as we work with these different uh, concepts and skills. And really one of the great, there are many great uh, thinkers uh, on this topic, but one that I think maybe some of you know, and I think is just an amazing uh, uh, kind of a researcher, therapist person is Daniel Stern. And of course, Stern, you know, was known for his work with infants and, and mothers and so forth. But I don't know how many of you have looked at his le last his last books. Um, the, his next to the last book was The Present Moment. And then his last book was Forms of Vitality, which are quite amazing because kind of they're written at the end of his life. And they bring together all of that amazing work that he did uh, over a lifetime. And there he talks a lot about these topics, attunement in particular. And, and he says he, forms of vitality for him is like, you know, each of us is a form, right? Each of us has a human form. And living, we live and we express our vitality, right? Some days we have a lot of it. Some days we don't have much of it. But there is a kind of a vitality signature, he says, that each of us has. And so his, he really explores this idea of forms of vitality, which are really life expressing itself through our forms and through our behaviors. And what he emphasizes, which is also something that, that Kellerman emphasizes, is the centrality of movement, right? That life actually, you know, we've probably heard life is movement, but it's specific movement, right? First, as we said before, it's pulsation, and pulsation is an action. It's a movement, it's an action, right, which has a, a cyclical rhythm to it, yeah. So he says movement is key in all of this. And then he says movement, of course, has four daughters. Some of you may have heard this if you've read, uh, read this book, right? But he says, first, there's a time contour. It takes, you know, it's a, not just that it takes time, but a time contour has a beginning, a rising, kind of a peak and a settling, you know, so that our movements have this time contour, which are part of what we attune to and gives us a lot of information. Yeah. Of course, movement is also space occupying. And when we look at people, we see what kind of space and volume they occupy. Some people live in tiny spaces and they really contain themselves and hold themselves in very restricted life spaces, yeah, and life fields. Other people, rah, you know, they just, uh, they, not, nothing is big enough for them. They want to occupy everybody's space, right? Everybody should be thinking about them all the time. And I'm not going to name any names, but you probably have some ideas that you get put in there, right? And so movement, life movement, besides the time contour, has a, it's a space occupying process, which also gives us a lot of information. Yeah. Also, motion has a force, an intensity, and an effort, right? And some people, you know, we they are just everything they do has a force and an intensity and an effort, which on some sometimes feels we call those people very vital, but sometimes it's leading us, leading people to burnout and to all kinds of breakdown processes, right? If everything you do has a certain force and intensity and effort to it, um, well, you know, there's going to be consequences you know, if it's not managed. And then the the fourth uh, daughter is intention, directionality. Yeah. So that every motion has a has an intentionality, a directionality. And so I think it's a beautiful kind of frame for interacting with people and their stories, right? Movement, right? The time, which is rhythmic, right? the space within it, the force, the intensity, and then the intentionality, the direction, where is it going, yeah? 
And so it's wonderful. I, I mean, uh, I, I never worked with uh, Stearns, but I don't know how he actually used it in his, uh, in his own uh, therapy sessions. But it's a beautifully, you know, uh, kind of flexible and adaptable model. And Kellerman has his way of kind of working with all of these, uh, which has been my foundation. And maybe we'll see a little bit of it in the weekend. Of course, we'll do more of that. Um, so it's a way of simplifying this incredible complexity, which is the human being. Yeah. And so the way we we use the four big topics of this uh, talk is we track the enacted story, right? Everybody comes to to their to their therapy and they tell a story. Most people don't sit on the sofa and say nothing. Occasionally it can happen, but even by doing that, they're actually communicating. So there's always a place to start. But in general, there is an enacted story because, you know, speech talking is an action and there's already an enactment. And depending on what the story is, you know, the feelings in it, the emotions in it, the history of it, the events of it, right? It's all going to be enacted in some form. So the, what we attune to are the dimensions of this enactment, right? Um, and certain aspects of that enactment, we want to amplify them because they contain information that's critical for a person healing and reforming themselves. Yeah. Um, so, um, and then we often, and people, we all, you know, have our blind spots. We don't know, why do I do it like this? Why, why do I always sabotage myself? Why, just when I get to the edge of success, I pull back. Well, you know, we've got, each of us has our million questions about how we form ourselves in different aspects of our lives. And so, you know, we're, we're tracking that, we're attuning to all of that, yeah, and resonating, amplifying certain dimensions of it, and mirroring back dimensions of it that the person maybe can't quite grasp or see on their own, yeah. And so, and then the critical piece is to do this in a rhythm that the person can stay with, assimilate, and help support them in finding their own rhythm of assimilation and forming. And this is where a lot of people just don't, we, we don't understand profoundly our rhythm, our, our real rhythm. You know, okay, we understand that maybe slowing down you know, ah, it's helpful. Ah, yes, it's restful. I can, you know, or we understand that, whoops, I got to speed up to get this done. We understand something about rhythm, but we may not understand the, the true rhythms of how we form ourselves, the true rhythms of how we learn, the true rhythms of how we move through a transition. These are really sophisticated skills which it takes, you know, that's what I, one of the things I learned from Kellerman was, was an incredibly sophisticated sense of rhythm um, that enables us to move through crises and conflicts and, you know, challenges in a way that doesn't, you know, that, that somehow we can stay present with and we can have, you know, an influence on and we don't get overwhelmed and we don't get stuck or frozen. Yeah. So rhythm is really an art. And I've learned a lot about rhythm through cranial work and polarity therapy and, and Ray's work too. Right. But um, so there's this quality of rhythm and pulse and tide, which is so powerful when we get a feeling for it and very connected to a whole field sense as well. So this is kind of where we, where we work, yeah. And um, so Kellerman has a beautiful uh, kind of practice. I don't know how, how many of you know a bit about Kellerman's people have probably heard of him, but working with him over a long period of time has been a, a mind boggler for me. 
Um, and he's one of the greats and he's appreciated, but I don't think he's as appreciated maybe as he should be. But he has something which he calls the bodying practice. You know, everybody these days knows that we're we're into embodying. Embodying is, you know, you know, is important, critically important. And the embodied mind, right? And and so he's got this bodying practice. And it's so he used to call it the five steps. It has kind of five steps. But you know, what we and what you know, and this is, I think, where there's a, some interesting parallels with Stern. You know, uh, Stern says, for example, that every gesture, every expression, every spoken phrase has this time contour, which he says lasts one to ten seconds. You know, and if you really watch people talking, you know, you'll find that their gestures will show up, and oh yeah, that was horrible, and man, she drives me nuts, and oh my heart was. Uh, you know, there are all these powerful gestures show up and then they disappear. And, you know, they, and yet they are, you know, they are kind of what, you know, what are called a full gestalt. He says that it's a whole event, you know, oh, that really hurt, you know, boy, that drove me crazy. I am so angry, right? And we can really recognize a lot of these gestures, but we also appreciate that they, they move right through as part of an ongoing story. And what we maybe don't appreciate is how much is an information additionally is in each of those gestures. This gesture, for example. Okay, well, on one level we go, wow, it's very heartfelt, that's okay. But heartfelt, wow, can really go deep into our experience. So we take something that the nervous system has given a shape to, an, an action to, a gesture to, and, and we hold it, first, first of all. We, we recognize it and we go, okay, why don't we ah, stay with this a little bit longer? And this is where things start to happen that are really most most of us I don't think have that ex have had that experience you know okay you know we've seen different types of motion and movement you know work and we maybe seen people hold something and so forth but what Kellerman has done he's developed this wonderful technology for in a way reverse engineering uh, an expression or a gesture you know because we know okay so I've made a gesture whatever it happens to be. Okay, we know it's quite complex. It's a complex motor act. So there's been a lot of, you know, muscles of different kinds, antagonists and so forth working together. And of course, all of this action has been innervated, right? By nervous system, motor, motor neurons. Those motor, motor neurons obviously have been, are responding to some type of sensory motor neurological image right, which of course has been organized because of some appreciation or understanding of the world around it and some attempt to deal with it. When we really begin to reverse engineer any gesture, whoa, we start to, to move into our systems and into an internal subjective space that most of us probably haven't explored in this way. And it's amazing the information that begins to show up as we do that. Yeah. And um, and so uh, interesting that Kellerman had this practice, which Stern in his own way kind of brings in in his final book after all his incredible experience um, uh, in his in his domain. Yeah. And there is actually quite a bit of very interesting work from neuro, neuro, neurobiologists and other people who also begin to highlight the, 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 this critical importance to behavior. We know it's important, you know, we use it, but there is a whole layer and depth to how we can work with movement and behavior in the foreground and then everything kind of spirals around that we begin to see what emotion what feeling 
what sensation, what intention begins to show up when we work this way. And like I say, I haven't seen anything quite like it, even though there are things that, that resonate with it. So we work then with the different rhythms of any expression, right? And if you sit with your heart long enough, say this, you know, ah, oh, something will shift. You'll start to breathe differently. Maybe your shoulders will start to reorganize, right? There will be a chain of events that really open up new spaces for you and new ways to respond to things that you've responded to habitually, either because of traumatic imprints or just habits that you have picked up or things you have imitated and learned along the way. This forming process and this bodying practice touches into all the life forms, right? And because trauma creates forms, trauma has its forms um, and its implications, as well as, you know, um, just learning in general. So anyway, I've tried to pack in a lot of stuff into this, this, this kind of short talk. I hope it hasn't been too dense. Um, but these are the the pieces that 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 kind of you know are that the attunement, the resonance, the mirroring, and the rhythm are in service of. They are in service of how we form ourselves and how we form our lives and how we form ourselves in different moments, right? You know, we've all had clients who have come in and really take stretch us to the max, right? You can go, boy, that's a complicated client. That's a difficult client. Maybe I should refer this client, right? And often these clients are what we would call formative challenges for us, right? And a formative challenge for us can have also many layers, right? It can have my own personal history, my own, right, blind spots, right? My own sense of my own constitution in re response. So anyway, this is the kind of material that we will go into with quite a bit more kind of, uh, you know, development and refinement as, as kind of the, the theoretical model or the conceptual model, you know, as someone said, you know, theory without practice is empty, but practice without theory can be blind, right? So we need both. We need to go back and forth between really theory, practice, experience. And from those three, we really get into the ability to, we get into skill levels, which we can really use in therapy. So anyway, that's the dance that I think, uh, you know, is, is, is critical, not just, I'm not the only one who dances that dance, but we all dance it in our own way and we dance it in a certain rhythm and um, anyway so that just to let you know kind of the ways I move into the material so I think actually um, I don't know are there any quick questions here before I think what we'll do then is we'll we'll invite a, a participant we'll do just a, we won't be able to do a whole session but we might do kind of an initial setup of a session and um, and then so you may be able to see some of the things I've been talking about uh, in action. But any questions at this point anybody would like to ask before we take that next step? Okay. Doesn't look like the hands aren't flying off the screen, so, okay. So either you're stunned and can't think of anything or you're, you know, anyway, a lot of different scenarios that are possible here. Well, so, somebody has taken their hand up there. Oh, they so. have. Okay. So Tim, is it Timo? Ta Timo? Yeah, Timo? 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 Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, thank you. Um, I'm okay. curious about um, if you'd speak to, um, as you're talking about gesture, Mm -hmm. talking about um the experience of it being a sort of internal uh, or a 
what did you call it? You said it was like a backwards process of reverse engineering process that, that begins to highlight different layers of your internal experience. Right. And would you speak to the transition between that and um, and creating space for new opportunities, reorganization, like new imprints to emerge? Or does yeah. that make sense? I mean, Kellerman no. talks about creating new memories, for example. Yeah. Well, you know, the idea is, you know, you know, there, there's a, a, there are actually a lot of books and kind of ways of working, but they say, well, let's go. Why don't you just let it go? Release it. Let it go. Ah, you know, so there's a lot of release work, which I'm not I'm not going to deny may have its its value in a lot of selling of let let it go. Just let it go. Just be aware of it. Let it go. You know, but I think, uh, you know, I think they have a limited they may occasionally work, but I think they have a limited effectiveness. It's like if I really have a deep seated imprint and a, a habitual way of doing something, whether it's a defense or, you know, a, a traumatic defense or a traumatic strategy, <clears throat> or it's just something I've learned to do because somebody I really admired did it that way. Maybe that's how daddy or mommy did it. So I have this, this quite, you know, layered organization in me. And, <clears throat> you know, if I try to impose other ways to do it, you know, we have something like, you know, these operating systems on computers where they're, they have old layers, systems layered on new systems. So, so part of the idea is to bring the pattern that you're living into the foreground, seeing how you've organized it, you know, what intentions it had, but actually not just from up here, feeling the intentions, experiencing them, and then beginning to disorganize at a rate that you can handle a lot of people try to get rid of you know but you know so that's where the rhythm comes in right and so we find our way to disorganize that opens up a space where a new form can begin to organize often with some of the same intentions but with much less stress on the system with a much more satisfying and mature uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, intention. Yeah, great. Okay, Thibaut, thank you. <laughs> great. Right. Masiman, Masiman, did you want to ask a question? Yes, thank you. Um, Jim, um, I wanted to ask what actually is... I need a little bit more volume from you, Masiman. Sorry, what actually is a gesture so I'm thinking that a gesture must be something that's almost unconscious. A gesture must be something that's almost unconscious. Well, you know, I mean, it probably has elements of conscious and, uncon and unconscious, right? But uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of gestures, which are not just hands, but, you know, body, posi body postures, motions, that in, can incorporate the hands, but incorporate more the head, the neck, the eyes, that these are often reflex actions. They're reflex because they're kind of instinctive reflex, if you want to talk about that, or, you know, uh, you know, emotional reflex, um, or um, they may be learned, right? And so, um, but they, they at a certain point, they've lost their accessibility to our ability to influence them. So they become, you know, just automatic ways of responding. And, you know, we don't, if you don't know how you've organized it, it's really hard to disorganize it, you know? So, um, yeah, but a lot of it is reflex. Kellerman talks about how, you know, we want to personalize the world of instinct and reflex so that, you know, when we get angry, we don't just, impulsively get angry or impulsively shrink into ourselves out of fear that we actually have a way to influence these so that they may be more appropriate and give us more range of possibilities in interacting with life situations and in managing ourselves right you know so that uh you know yeah we just aren't so reactive or victim to our own uh 
reactions to things, which I think people understand. So I don't know if that answers your question, Masuma. Yes, and I think it's also, you know, practical, and I probably becomes clearer with practical oh, understanding it's, of what. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a, you know, words will take you so far. Yeah. Um, they're a start, but yeah, you have to see it in action. And it's it's both a practice and it's highly practical, <laughs> highly practical in helping us manage, uh, you know, our our experience and and the shape of our lives. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So maybe one more, just so that we have a little time for an interactive process. Is there one more question or not? If that not, we'll go right to it. Okay. Nothing. Okay. So why don't we? Why don't we, uh, do you have somebody in mind, Kate? That um... Yes, I've asked Connie Fazio. Okay. So I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to spotlight both of you. Great. Um, thank you, Connie, for volunteering. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Connie Fazio. I had a friend named, uh, no, it's not a different spelling. I had a friend named Vic Fazio, but uh, that's a, You've got a different spelling. Okay, so kind of we're not obviously we we have it's going to be a, a contained a short interactive session, but you know we'll we're just going to kind of get started in a way, and um, and so I'm going to invite you to maybe have a topic that you'd like to explore a little bit, and as we do it, I'll also describe a little bit of my attuning resonance process so that people maybe see it in action but also I can I'll make selected comments to the group just so you know how we're gonna set this up okay and and it'll be contained because we don't have so much time but I appreciate your willingness to kind of step in and, and uh, see what happens well thank you for the invitation sure great so do you have something you would like to explore a little bit here yeah I've got a couple of options um something present time or i just found out that i i had a hospitalization as a child at one years old which i've been having this pattern of every every 12 months you know having distress and never understanding it so would you like present time or that old piece whatever you'd like to touch into you see now just just to name what i'm tracking right <laughs> so yes, all this <laughs> Right. So we, you know, there's this experience that shows up every 12 months or so. So this was one motion. Ah, I see that it has a trajectory and a rhythm and you can already resonate to it a little bit. Yeah. And then there was this distress. So in the story of this hospitalization, right, we have two interesting motions, which we could explore. Mm -hmm. uh, what what happens for you as I kind of show them back to you? Because this is a little bit of mirroring, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I feel um, more expansiveness internally, more connection with with the emotional state that lies under the surface. Interesting, right? So just that little bit of paying attention and mirroring has already, you know, shifted something. Yeah. Ah, look at that. See, wow. So I think people track, you know, so you can see Connie has taken something in. And as I kind of sit with you, I, I almost feel like there's kind of a something, it's almost like a little bit of a descending wave in you. Do you mm -hmm. notice? A little tear action. A, a little, little tear action. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Great. You see? So I think you people can begin to see how the enacted dimension of this story is actually evoking a whole internal world also. Ah, and, you know, maybe things that you can't perceive, but I'm tracking also kind of the field, right? The tidal motions from which, which you can feel, I'm sure. Yeah, it's kind of a... Right, right. Uh-huh, great. See, so already... See, that's, there's a, a, a bit of a settling moment in even just these few minutes, right, of dialogue. Ah, interesting. 
Ah, what's coming up for you now? Whoa. Right. Yeah. Ah, so what did, can you say anything about that? Just, you know, don't force it. But if you yeah, no, just my, my, uh, the, the, the muscles in between my ribs relaxed and my diaphragm opened and, you know, I could open up and just take a nice expansive breath. Great. Yeah. And so, a feeling of delight, you know. Right. Yay. <laughs> right. Great and, and wonderful. You know, these are some of the things that happen with the attunement and the resonance, the amplification and the mirroring, right, which we're doing together. You know, it's a very much of a dialogue together. And you can probably also feel there's a rhythm to it. Ah, wonderful. See, and amazing. You know, when that happens efficiently and quickly, the changes can be quite quick. And, and you know, so more space, more breath, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of a, a nice first step into something, right? I wouldn't say this is the end of the process, but it's a very nice first step. Yes. Yeah. And as I mentioned in the, you know, in the, in the, uh, in the descript course description, right, we're building a, I think a very nice little working alliance here so far. Ah, great. So to name, see, and everything you name is a, right, goes into the field that we share. Ah, nice. Look at that. See. Oh, great. See, so just even naming that. It has a resonance, right? And uh, great. Mm. So good. So, do you want to take another step with this, Connie? Sure. So, so what what's coming up for you in this moment? You see, already it's a different moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, different. Yeah. Yeah, different moment in the process. Ah, and she has to, and now if you look at at Connie's way of deciding what's next, it's so different, right? See, if you were paying attention, if you go back to the to the recording, when we started, she was really looking around, she was doing this, looking around. There was a lot of mental and I kind of looking around, what am I going to do? It could be this or that. And now when she's looking for ah, the next step, what a different way to look. Whoa, your own internal looking is much more embodied, much more bodily and has a whole other rhythm. Ah, wonderful, see? And for you to appreciate that shift in yourself. I keep feeling the sensation of, Oh, this this is what safety is. Mm, right. I like this. Ah, all right. <laughs> ah, so the shape of safety for you. That's great. The experience. Yes, exactly. Uh, does that change a little bit your sense of what safety is? Oh, yeah. Mm, right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. See, so things connect, right? Things Ah, great. Uh -huh. So what's possible when you experience this quality of safety? What becomes possible for you? More movement, more possibility. I feel it. Uh, oh, I don't feel so rigid. What, what may I do? Wow, great. Nice, exactly. So that kind of safety also gives you a sense of more freedom and possibility, right? Wonderful. See, so really nice. Well, thank you, Connie. Great. Okay. I think that's that's a nice, that was about as nice a little a little contained uh, moment together. So good. You feel okay there with this? Yes. Uh, All right. right here? Thank yeah. you so much, Connie. Yeah, thank you very much. That was great. See, so yeah, anyway, I think this gave you a nice little vision. Not every every moment, every session's a bit different, but I think you began to see the principles in action, right? 
the attuning starts right away, the resonance by amplifying it, right? The mirroring, sending in a little bit of information the other person recognizes as them and yet adds something a bit different, right? And then finding the rhythm of it, right? So all four of those, I think you could see in that short interaction. Shall we open it up again? If there are any comments, questions, feedback, anything from there? Anybody would, because uh, that's a whole other game to kind of talk about. I have some more things I could say, of course, but. Well, I can ask you a question, Jim. All right, Kate, go to it. Well, so you chose this gesture of the cycle that she was doing with her hand, but she right. did other gestures. What yeah. let what what it led you to choose this one that? Well, I think that's when she mentioned the hospitalization. So she mentioned that, you know, that that uh, kind of learning that she had. Wow, I was hospitalized at one at one year old. So that gesture showed up alongside with the hospitalization, mm -hmm. a, a cycle, right? Every every year, a cycle this shows up and creates distress. Distress, so those, yeah. So those two gestures were very tied into that learning about the hospitalization. So it seemed like they could be important. There could be further information in there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, so we had a context for it. You know, you want, it's nice when you look at the, sh the shaping, the gestures and the expressions that you have at least some context context for it. And often if something important, you know, hospitalization, some other event you might call traumatic, whatever, uh, or some moment that stands out for some reason, that gives you a context. And and that's often where we, we look at the gestures tied into that and work with those. Yeah, so you want enough context. We don't have to, as you can see, we didn't have to, have to go into a lot of detail about it. We didn't need it. We had just enough. And the memory and the, you know, I mean, people talk about motor memory, but I think this kind of adds other layers of information and possibility in the motor memory. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, Nasima? You're muted now. Sorry, I haven't asked another group. Sorry, there we go. Um, yeah, so um, I just really, it, it was interesting to see how the minute you started mirroring the gesture, that it rang to me that that was a level of attunement and it brought resonance. You know, it's like it was all, they were all together, it seemed. So yeah. I was just curious about that. Like they all just kind of came at once, just in sort of mirroring the, the gesture. They, they are together, but I've been doing this for a while. So, you know, so I bring them all into a kind of a, you know, it's like bringing in the violin with the oboe, with the drums, you know what I mean? You, you're you bringing in the different layers, of different skills yeah. into hopefully a bit of more of a symphonic process. Yeah. But yeah, they are differentiated on one level, but they they all work together when you're in action. Sure. Because all four of them are are in play, you know, but maybe one might be more in play, right? So, but of course, you know, the resonance, the mirroring, and the gesture and the resonance was all of a piece. And then, yeah, and and also, you know, to invite Connie in this case to do it in a way that had a certain rhythm. Right. So, so because if you do it like this, you may not get but you find, ah, the rhythm that ah, something got connected. Oh, and then you shift it over to the distress. And even in the distress, you've got rhythms and variants, right? So, yeah, so you're right. They're all working together once you can kind of, once you practice with them, sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. And of course, the verbal dimension is another part of it. Right. So I'm kind of 
I'm kind of mirroring and resonating verbally as well. And so I'm very, really attuned to what happens when I use a word or what happens when I make a statement or what happens when Connie makes a statement to herself, to me, but also to herself. And so I'm really attuned to kind of the effects of those. And so, you know, so it's a, it's a total, it's a total package. I'm, I'm using my own body, my own, right. My own responsiveness, you know, both in gesture, in feeling, in rhythm, and in word. And that's why, you know, that's just something that gets built up, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it's all formative, right? Great. Right. Thank you. Good. Any, anybody else? Anything? Okay. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot there. Sometimes it's hard to know how to, you know, orient to something a little bit new. But, um, um, you know, but, uh, you know, there's a story I like to tell. Um, it's, you know, which, uh, which was kind of one of my, you know, Zen koan moments. I've told it many times. Some of you have heard it. But it was when I first worked with Kellerman in a group process. Kate's heard this a million times. So, but anyway, but it was such an epiphany for me, you know, when, I, you know, he said, well, somebody like to work. He worked with people in group, in the group, of course. So I raised my hand and he said, okay, go ahead. And I said, well, you know, what I've been feeling lately is, because, you know, in virtually all I've been doing therapy and everybody wanted to know what you were feeling. What are you sensing? What are you feeling? So I started out with, well, what I've been feeling is this. I figured this is what therapy is about. And he stopped me in my tracks and he says, I don't care what you're feeling. I'm not interested in what you're feeling. What are you doing? And I'm going, huh? It was like, what do you mean? What am I doing? I had no idea what he was asking me. I said, I'm sitting here talking to you. What do you mean? What am I doing? And it was like, he, it was a wake up call to a whole dimension of my experience that has taken me in a way, years to figure out, you know, that my feeling and my sensing and my thinking is really built around my doing. And exactly what that means is one of the richest explorations I've ever been on over time. And, um, and there are very, it's a very interesting proposal because a lot of you know, like I say, a lot of different types of therapy, which very, very useful. I mean, it's not to, to deny the effectiveness of many approaches, but there's something about appreciating how doing is a, is a central organizing function of the body from its, you know, physiological pulsing to all the motion that happens to keep our body going to, you know, heart pumping, to all the motions that reflect what we have learned in life, what we experienced in life, what we can do in life. And so there's something about, you know, bringing behavior to the foreground in a much more powerful way than is normally done, which is just so rich and, and, um, and has many, again, many layers to it. And um, I think that's one of Kellerman's brilliant uh, kind of, offerings which a lot of people haven't quite gotten people read his books which are you know interesting sometimes not so easy but unless you've worked with him over the years you don't appreciate actually sometimes the what he's really talking about in that process so we work with you know the behavior the gesture the posture and then with the rhythms of it right the slowing it down the speeding it up and there's a whole series of ways of work the waiting the pauses a whole series of ways of working with with behavior that opens up all the other functions of the body the feeling the felt sense and the and the emotional dimension and memory dimension so good so that's what we're actually also what we're going to explore in the in the three day that i'm doing in october we're going to obviously take these dimensions and um and open them up obviously 
both conceptually, but also we'll, there'll be a lot of practices for people to explore their own organization. And then we'll obviously do some interactive process uh, so you can track and, and attune and mirror um, you know, uh, the other the other person's story. And we'll do as much as we can get done in three days, which is, you know, I think a, a nice, certainly a lot more we can do than we can do in an hour. But I think it'll be a very hopefully interesting, practical, exciting course and opens up a whole territory, which for me has been a life's work. So, so. Okay, well, thank you for coming today, Jim, and thank you all who are here and who will be listening in the future for tuning in, listening to Jim's uh, work that he is now calling formative embodiment as he combines so many things that he's learned over the years into his own method and is very interesting to be a part of. So uh, we invite you all to come. It's a hybrid course in person in Washington, D.C., or you can tune in online and um, I'll send out the recording to all of you along with more information if you wish. Great. Thank you, Kate. Thanks everybody. Really nice. Thanks, Thanks for coming today. Okay. See you next time. Okay. Bye-bye.